information. Is that true or not? And I said, well, I don't know that it's true or not. She says, that means we'll come back as a cat next time? And I said, no, that's the transmigration. That's different than reincarnation. So she said, well, what about Jesus? Is he reincarnated? I said, I don't think that's what the resurrection is about. She said, what is it about? I said, well, that's a very good question, and Christians are still trying to discuss this. We call it a mystery. She said, what does that mean, that you don't know how to explain it? I said, no, that it means that my explanations will not exhaust it. A mystery is not something that we de declare when we simply don't have the answer or is incapable of being comprehended. It's something that we say is inexhaustibly a source of knowledge and wisdom and experience. The mystery of God is not that we can't know anything. It's that it cannot be exhausted by our own experience and our own elaboration of the truth of it. So that is why uh, God never gets stale or old. Our explanations might, our responses might, uh, but the reality, the mystery of the living presence, the energy that, that drives the universe, the love that is at the heart of all of this, is something that we will never exhaust. So I said, well, if that means, for example, that the world that Jesus lived in turned against him. He came to talk about love, the great commandment, how we are here to learn to love like God is love, like God loves, and to receive, to let God's love in, to say yes to that, and then see what would happen next. He was here to show us how to be servants of one another, and how we see God in each other, and that we can be the media or examples of the love of God and the energy of God in ourselves, just as he was. And he did not come to start a religion, but one happened anyway. And he didn't come to start a new kingdom or, or empire, but the empire that existed found this to be threatening. I said, somehow, a person who was so dedicated to showing us the way, the truth, and the life, aroused such hatred and enmity that he was executed and put to death in a really horrible way. But Easter says that that did not stop him. That's what Easter means. Easter is a way of affirming that no matter how ugly the world gets, the light cannot be extinguished. It says, it says so in a very poetic way in the first chapter of the Gospel from which I read a moment ago. The light was in the world, the darkness cannot overcome it. And we don't meet darkness with more darkness. We don't meet, as he did, power with power or to refute through argument. He simply stood for love. And one of the things that he would always say, and all the things, the things that angels always would say, is don't be afraid. Don't be anxious about your life. So if, if death is not the last word, which is what's implied by this mystery of the missing Jesus on Easter Day, then what is there to fear? Can you imagine living a life without fear? I read somewhere, and this is something that you can see in lots of your contexts, uh, scientific articles about the architecture of the brain, for example, or the latest incarnation, if I'm going to use that word, about uh, how we think and the things that occupy our minds. I think I saw the figure 60,000. There are 60,000 thoughts that occur to us in the course of the day, and most of them are negative. We, we, we spin yarns to ourselves about things that might happen. It seems as though we feel that if we rehearse for the worst that might happen, we're going to be somebody able to cope with it better. But I like what the wizard in J.K. Rowling's latest story, which is made into a movie, said. That's a fantastic beast where to find them. The sort of protagonist of the story is this sort of renegade wizard, young wizard who likes to collect exotic creatures and runs afoul of the authorities, except for all the stuff we're going to record at the end of my sermon last week. Who says, well, my philosophy is if you worry, you suffer twice. It's so true. How so much of our misery is self-inflicted. Well, what if we just made a decision to believe what Jesus said? Just decide to do that. I'm not going to be afraid. I am going to live like Jesus lived. I'm going to be someone who chooses love, who chooses life, no matter what happens, knowing that wherever may lead me and the trouble that I might encounter along the way because I'm doing what he did, I will somehow survive, maybe even flourish, maybe even be more alive than I was before. Because what is a life that is governed by fear like? It's very small and 
restricted, cautious. It's painful to live that way. There's a reason why that is the message. There's a reason why in these great stories from antiquity, the messengers of God, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid. Jesus walking on the water, they thought it was a ghost. I probably would think that too. Who could do that? Would I want to be friends with anybody that could do that? Maybe. Don't be afraid. So the worst thing that could happen to somebody is what happened to him. Who stood for such life and truth, goodness and justice? Put to death, and yet continues to live. So we can agonize, debate, and have a lot of fun, philosophically speaking, deciding, deliberating about whether this is a story to be taken as little factual truth, and that the body of Jesus was resuscitated mysteriously by God. But the end result is the same, that he lives. And even though there's no record, no real record outside of the New Testament of the existence of Jesus of Nazareth, and there's not, there really isn't, and any honest scholar will tell you so, how could a movement like this have started? That is history. That is reality. But the one the Romans thought they had killed continued to live, People still feel that they can have a relationship with an indestructible life empowered by 